Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, welcome to uh, Higher Structure Seminar of Feza Gürse Institute. Today, our speaker is Theo Johnson Freight from Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. And he will talk on uh, higher algebraic closure. Yeah, please. Thank you very much for the, the opportunity, the invitation to speak. Um, and I wish I could could join in person, but it's nice to be able to kind of teleport for, for the hour. Um, so, right, I'm going to tell you about higher algebraic closure. Everything I say is, everything in the talk is joint work, and everything in the talk is in progress um, with David Reuter, who's at, um, now at Hamburg University. Um, and nothing's like written in a kind of article format yet. It's all but kind of that my these slides are available on my website and also lots of other slides that, that are kind of overlapping material are available. Um, and so right, so let me sort of dive in. This is going to be a somewhat technical talk, but that means um, please interrupt with with questions, that's the whole point um, of, of giving an in-person, you know, giving a live lecture. So, um, yeah, so I, I kind of want to dive in and just give you the sort of main, the main goal of our work. So let me tell you two theorems that are the sort of zeroth and first statements that I want to generalize. Um, so the, these are, so the first theorem I want to tell you about is, um, basically due to Hilbert. Um, and, and it says that, although maybe bit, bits of it are also, anyway, the theorem set is, is Hilbert's Nullstellensatz. Hilbert's Nullstellensatz is, is very famous. We teach it to, you know, you teach it to undergraduates. Um, and it, one way of saying it, it's sort of, I, I won't give like all precise details because that I want to give the, 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 the content of the theorem. It says that if you have an commutative algebra, a commutative, say, algebra over the real numbers. And if it is not the zero algebra, and also if it's not too ginormous. So in, in Hilbert's formulation, the size constraint should be that it should be finitely generated. That's a, a size constraint on an algebra. Then you can definitely find a commutative algebra homomorphism to the complex numbers. Um, and you cannot necessarily find an algebra homomorphism back to the real numbers, like the complex numbers does not go back to the real numbers, but any algebra goes to the complex numbers, any non-zero algebra. Um, and this is a version, Hilbert sort of, what the way Hilbert says it is, he says that if for any algebraically closed field, you can do this and you can always get into the algebraic closure. So he, he doesn't just start with R and C, he says for any, um, any field in its algebraic closure, you can do this. The fact that C is the algebraic closure of R is usually credited to Gauss, although you can go and read the, the history. It's quite subtle. This is a, um, Gauss had a proof that was later shown to have a, a hole and it took another hundred years for Gauss's original proof to be patched. And meanwhile, other people came up with complete proofs. There's a stronger version of the Nullstellensatz. So Hilbert's Nullstellensatz says that there exists a homomorphism. And you can ask, okay, what can I say about the space of all homomorphisms? So Hilbert actually shows a, a slightly stronger statement. Um, well, if you take any homomorphism from the algebra to the complex numbers, then the algebra itself, any element of the algebra gives you a function on the set of homomorphisms from the so if you take, this is the function that takes an element, see if I can squeeze this in on the nice, I've, I've kind of overloaded my, all my slides are like very, very densely packed because, so this is, this is the homomorphism that takes an element to the function that takes a homomorphism to just evaluation. This is like the, you know, this is this, the, the most basic thing you can do. This is um, currying if you want. Um, so Hilbert shows that for any finitely generated algebra, this inclusion, this map, which you always get for any algebra at all, um, this, this map is always an injection. And if the algebra satisfies a much stronger size constraint than Hilbert needs, then it's actually an isomorphism. 
That's a, a version of a statement that actually R into C is not just the algebraic closure, but also the Galois closure. And the stronger size constraint here would be like that it be a finitely generated, sorry, finite dimensional and um, sub and sep um, and separable algebra, finite dimensional semi simple algebra. Semi simplicity is itself a type of size constraint because it constrains the sizes of of the derived homomorphisms of modules. Okay, so that's that's nice. Like this is this is. Um, 100 year old or 300 year old mathematics. So now let me tell you a statement that's maybe 20 years old. Um, so, so in around 2000, Deline proved a theorem. He didn't say it exactly this way. This was the, this translation was something I noticed, but it was, was Deline's theorem. And so Deline showed the same Null Stolensat statement, but proved it one dimension up. He proved it for commutative, for symmetric modal categories. So I'll just repeat the statement. He said that if you have any symmetric monodal category over the real numbers, um, and which isn't zero and satisfies a size constraint, um, then there's always a homomorphism from a back to the super to not to vector spaces. You can't get down to the vector spaces over the complex numbers necessarily, but you can get to super vector spaces. Um, and, and super vector spaces is like a, a Z2 extension of vector spaces in the same way that the complex numbers is a Z2 extension of the real numbers. Um, and moreover, Deline proves that under a, slight, a slightly stronger size constraint, if you do this currying map, if you, so this is, there's always a map from any category to this, so you can take, let's say you can take all of the symmetric monodal maps from your category to super vector spaces, and for any element of your category, you can get a function on that set valued in super vector spaces. So it's actually a homomorphism of, instead of groupoids, I probably mean homomorphism of sets. Well, groupoids where you think of just vector spaces, super vector spaces and isomorphisms. Um, and I'm not, I don't really, you can ask me the, the actual size constraints to make Deline's theorem that Deline proves are a little subtle. So the the, to get this statement to just be an isomorphism of plane groupoids, the size constraints are straightforward. It's exactly the same as what you'd need for the Galois extensions. You just need a you need very strong size constraints. You need it to be basically a finite dimensional and some semi-simple category. Deline's size constraint for the general Mulstein sets is a more complicated thing. It's not nearly as pretty. Hilbert's size constraint just says finitely generated. And Deline gives examples of finitely generated categories that don't satisfy this this version of null stolen sets it's a more subtle thing but it's still a size constraint and um you can you know read about it or ask me later so the goal of our work and the goal of what i want to tell you about is kind of to take to take this sequence the complex numbers which is kind of a commutative zero category super vector spaces that's a commutative one category and and explain to you what the higher version of that sequence goes. Super duper vector spaces. So how do I set this up? I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm gonna dive into some technical stuff. So, um, so let me tell you what context I wanna do, use to use commutative algebra, to do commutative algebra. Um, so I'd like to just work with, with all dimensions of categories at a time. Um, something that you notice early on, if you look at a symmetric monoidal category, it has a commutative ring living at the identity. And you can go the other way, you can try to de-loop. You can pick a, you can, given a commutative ring, you can find a symmetric monoidal category that has that commutative ring as its endomorphisms of identity. And if you ask for iterated de-loopings, um, that, right, so, so the point is that if you, if you have a category, I'll call the loop space of that category, we'll, I'll call that the, I'll, be, I'll say, sort of think of endomorphisms of the identity element as the loop space of the category. And as soon as you have a notion of loop space, you get a notion of spectrum. And so it makes sense to say that, a, a, so Claudia Scheinbauer calls these towers. This, I mean, the, I think the idea would, might have been older than her, but, but like she, her thesis was a good place to read about this idea. And um, and she's the one who gave the name tower to this structure. 
Um, so a tower is a sequence of categories such that each one is a de-looping of the previous term in the sequence. And those of you who know about kind of algebraic topology, this is exactly a, a spectrum in, in algebraic topology, except with categories. So it's like a non-invertible spectrum. And just like a spectrum, the, the infinite loop structure induces symmetric monoidal, induces an abelian group structure on the, the levels of the spectrum. The infinite loop structure here induces symmetric monoidal structure on the categories. So some examples to think about, first of all, if you have any symmetric monoidal category, it has like a one point de-looping. That's just a sort of trivial thing. Um, you could think of this as kind of an eilenberg maclean spectrum if you wanted. And another thing you could do, for instance, well, this is you could pick a group and you could look at kind of representations of that group in higher and higher dimensions. Two categories with a group action, three categories with a G action, and so on. So it's a, it's a good world to talk about kind of commutative algebra where you have categories of, of unbounded number. That's too big of a world for me. I, we, we're still working on how far we can go. We don't know what an abelian category, an abelian higher category is. They're sort of, it's, not, it's not at all clear what the word abelian should mean for, for, at least not to me, what an abelian three category is. But I do know what a semi-simple three category is. And um, so that's what where I'm actually going to work in. And remember that that for some of the Nolstonsat statements, I told you for the kind of Galois stuff, semi-simplicity was was part of like a Galois extension is always in particular semi-simple algebra. So I'm going to just build some semi-simplicity in. So with with Davide Gallardo at Perimeter Institute, we explained what um, okay we didn't explain what semi-simple is. That's that's more recent, but. Um, a semi-simple n category is just an n, like what is a semi-simple one category? Well, there's various things you could say. You could say it's an abelian category with where every object decomposes a direct sum of simples, but there's other descriptions that don't need to know what the word abelian means. And it's enough to say that it's basically a Carubian category, meaning that it has splittings of idempotents and direct sums. Um, if you have a one category which has splittings of idempotents and direct sums and which has the property that all endomorphism rings are semi-simple, then it's already a semi-simple category. So what we did with, with Gyoto was to explain what Carubian means, what this sort of splitting of, of higher, what higher idempotents are. So now, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but, but because that's a different talk. Um, but you can take my word that we do have a good, robust theory of idempotence for higher categories of like the, the, the n-dimensional version of idempotent that takes advantage of the fact that you have n directions of non-invertible composition. Um, and so our definition is that a, an n-category is semi-simple if it has direct sums and idempotence. All endomorphism rings are semi-simple. That's, well, that's the endomorphism rings being semi-simple. That's something you can measure at the very top of the category, just at the sort of top morphisms, if you And um, the last thing you can say is that the sort of semi-simplicity in, in the top dimension is analogous to asking in lower dimensions that, that all morphisms have adjuncts. And I realized that there's a typo on the slide. This should be N. Okay. Good. So the slides on the that are on the website already will need to be updated. I will do that after the talk. Okay. So um, an example is the following. One of the ways to build uh, how do you build a semi-simple one category? Well, what you do is you pick up a semi-simple ring and you just take its modules, or rather you take its finite dimensional modules. And because it, and in general, how do you build a category? Well, you can pick up a ring and build like the category of all of its modules. Um, there's a, any ring has a category of, of finitely general projective modules, which are just the, the, anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, 
there's a sort of general structure of taking of taking modules that that I'm going to call sigma of, of c. It's a sort of suspension operation, and it's just you take the one point delooping I told you. So that's like you take a ring and you make the category that only contains one object in that ring, and then you close that ring off for direct sums and splittings of item points. And for any ring, you can do this, um, and it just exactly gives you the finitely generated projective modules for that ring. That's what closing off for direct sums and item potents is. And um, I'm going to call that construction sigma. And if C itself was semi simple and monoidal and, and rigid monoidal, rather, um, then, um, then its suspension, this sort of sigma construction, gives you a semi simple n category. So that, that's the sort of most basic thing you can do is just sort of take Ruby completions. Um, so my, the, the, I said at the beginning, my, my motivation for the talk was to work out what the higher category of super duper of complex, sort of what sort of complex super duper uh, categories are. And now I'm telling you the category for me is going to mean one of these semi-simple towers. Okay. So this is, I'm just sort of assembling the, the, the statement, the pieces so that I can tell you the main term. I have to tell you a little bit more about semi-simple higher categories. Um, so, I mean, the, the thing I wanna warn you is that, that the very well-known Schur's lemma from one categories is subtle in higher categories. And that's the kind of takeaway of this, of this slide. Um, so, so, yeah, so what does Scher's lemma say? Let me not just read this slide to you. Let me just sort of say it in the other, like slightly different order. So, so Scher's lemma is some in, in one category, it says that, that in say an abelian category and a semi-simple category, any reasonable one category, you might be able to work out what it means for objects to be simple. One way that you could say that an object is simple is an object simple if every map out of that object is either zero or an injection, either zero or a monic. Well, that definition makes perfectly good sense in n categories. And it was, um, the reference I know is, is, um, is the paper of Douglas and Reuter that introduced kind of fusion two categories, semi-simple two categories. So, there's so it makes perfectly good sense to talk about simple objects in a semi simple n category. It's still true that every object decomposes a direct sum of simples, so it feels very much like semi simple one category. The problem, or not problem, but the, the thing to be careful about is that semi simple higher categories, um, it's what's not true in higher categories is that if you have a non-zero map between simples, then it's necessarily an isomorphism. Um, the reason why this isn't true, how would you prove the Scherz lemma? The way you'd usually prove the Scherz lemma is you'd say, well, I have two simples, I have a non-zero map between them. Um, and you prove that simple on the one hand implies that every non-zero map out is an injection, but simple also implies that every non-zero map in is a surge action. So you have a map which is both an injection and a surge action. And now you have to prove that a map which is both an injection and a surge action is actually an isomorphism. And this is the thing that failed in higher categories. And um, so, so that fails, it just fails. You can like, it fails immediately as soon as you get to two categories. But a version still survives. The version that survives is that if you, the version that still survives is that although there are different simple objects which are connected by non-zero maps, this notion of connectivity is an equivalence relation. It's just a coarser equivalence relation than isomorphism. And so the thing that, so that, that's what, what Douglas and Reuter call the, the higher Schur's lemma. It says it's the statement that, that connected by a non-zero map is an equivalence relation on the simple objects. This is a statement we can prove for semi-simple n categories. I am sure this is true for abelian n categories, 
except that I don't know what an abelian n category is. So as soon as you tell me the definition of abelian n category, I will prove this, or you will, you will, you should prove this statement. This should be like a test. Like one of the things an abelian n category should have is it should have this statement. Um, so anyway, this is this is this is a, a provably true statement for semi-simple things and a morally true statement for for abelian n categories. Um, anyway, so the the thing that in higher category theory plays the role. In one category theory, it's very useful to talk about the set of, of isomorphism classes of simple objects. Um, and you often, when you're doing representation theory, you often break up an object as built out of its simple subquotients, simple summaries. And the thing in higher category theory that often plays the role of that set is the set of components for this coarser equivalence relation. It's not simple objects up to isomorphism, it's simple objects up to sure connectivity. Um, and we call this the, the sort of pi zero of the category, the, the sure components of the category, because it really feels like the connected components. Semi-simple n categories feel a lot like spaces. They feel a lot like, like objects of homotopy theory. And this set feels like this, the connected components of that space. Um, so. So that's the the great. So now I'm, I'm I'm as I said I'm sort of assembling ingredients in order to tell you the main thing. Okay, now I can get into the meat of what we do. So my goal was to tell you what how to build. Uh, let's see, an algebra. I'll start saying tower when I mean semi-simple tower. My goal is to build an algebraically closed tower. And um, there's sort of, and that's, so that's the goal. I wanna build an algebraically closed tower and I'm gonna try to build it piece by piece, level by level. Um, I don't know it exists yet. I'm gonna try to try to bootstrap my way to it. So the first observation that I can make, so of course, how do I build something? I, I hope it exists. I measure some things without it assuming it exists. And then I go build a thing with, that has those properties. And then I prove that the thing I've built has, is the thing I want. This is, this is how every physicist solves any physics problem. It's probably how mathematicians solve math problems too. So I, so I take as an onset that, the, that this object exists and then I, I study it. Okay, so if there is an algebraically closed tower that goes forever, then certainly each level of it will be algebraically closed among n categories. And that's just because the loop construction I told you and the suspension construction I told you, there's a good adjunction between those. And so what this tells me is this tells me that if I can build an n minus one category, which is algebraically closed, I can suspend it, which was just this sort of silly module, like this kind of connected delooping. The suspension, by the way, is, the, is precisely the connected semi-simple category, which deloops the, um, the given loop space. So it's, this is among semi-simple things, this is the connected delooping of your space. So I'll build my n category as an extension of, the, of its connected delooping. And just from the definition of sure components, it will be a sum indexed by, the, by pi zero, whatever that is. And so all, in some sense, all I need to do is to work out inductively, I'd have to work out who the n minus first object is, who the, connected components of the nth object are and how those two data are, fit, are stuck together. Sort of how extension theory works. So just to, let me sort of tell you the zeroth and first examples, of course, the zeroth example doesn't quite fit in the notion of connected components, but so anyway, um, the complex numbers is a Z2 extension of the real numbers. And super vector spaces is a Z2 extension of regular vector spaces. A super vector space, I, I don't know if, I assume that that's a sort of notion that you've come across, but a super vector space, this is the, this is the definition. A super vector space is by definition, a pair of vector spaces. Um, one of them called just an ordinary vector space and the other one's called a fermionic vector space. And um, let me kind of remind, let me sort of do it by analogy. So in the complex numbers, a complex number is an ordered pair of real numbers. And the multiplication law um, is that if you multiply in 
in, in the complex numbers, you get almost the multiplication law you'd expect. The multiplication law you'd expect is a times a, a prime plus b b prime, a b prime minus plus b a prime. That's what you would expect for just z two graded um, vec numbers. That would be the group ring of z two. And that's not quite the rule in the complex numbers. The rule in the complex numbers is you put a minus sign in one spot. Well, what is that minus sign? That you should think of as the Bs are in grading degree one. And this minus sign is um, like minus one to the degree of B. So the sign, what am I trying to say? All of these signs, this plus sign, this minus sign, this plus sign, and this plus sign are of the form. Um, so the sign is minus one to the degree of the first thing times the degree of the second. That's the sign rule in the complex numbers. Okay. In, in super vector spaces, you have a pair of vector spaces. The multiplication law, again, is a Z2 graded, like it looks like the group ring of Z2. So the multiplication law should be a B kind of tensored with A prime B prime looks like, well, A A prime, A tensor A prime plus B tensor B prime, A B prime plus B A prime. Those are in you know, tensors. Um, and now what I do is I squeeze a sign in. The sign doesn't get squeezed in with here, because there's no way to take differences. Like super vector spaces, you know, vector spaces, you can't subtract vector spaces. So the sign doesn't squeeze in at the first order um, multiplication law. Where the sign gets squeezed in is uh, on the symmetry itself. So these are supposed to be symmetric monumental categories. And the sign gets squeezed in that if you compare a braiding, you get a sign difference from the other braiding, minus one to the degree times degree. So that changes. So here in the complex numbers, I actually change the multiplication law in super vector spaces. I actually change the, um, the symmetry, the commutativity law. Okay, so those are some examples of, of extensions. And these examples both happen to be abelian extensions. There's no reason Galois extensions should be abelian. Of course, you all know there's fields with the non-abelian Galois groups. Um, but, but these extensions happen to be abelian. You, so, so I'm gonna look in general for extensions. Um, this is a hint that maybe I will get, be, get lucky and maybe I'll get to only use abelian extensions. And in fact, that hint is correct. So with, with Matthew Yu, who was a student of mine at Perimeter, he's gonna be at Oxford next year um, for a postdoc. We, we gave a theorem, we proved the theorem kind of for, for two categories, but the proof generalizes immediately for N categories. And our theorem says that actually under some very mild condition, if you have a, a rigid symmetric model, semi-simple category, um, which has the super vector spaces as, at the top, anything that looks like super vector space at the top. So for instance, any of our towers, right? I told you, okay, I told you that all the towers I care about are algebraically closed. And so if you go to dimension one, you have to get the algebraically closed one category, which was super vector spaces. So I'm definitely gonna be super vector space at the top. So I get to apply my theorem. Um, and the theorem is that um, if you have super vector space at the top, then your whole category is an abelian extension. It has an, a group, and if it's a, if it's symmetric monoidal, then this is an abelian group. And um, you have an abelian group of components, and you are an abelian extension of your connected component. And I want to suggest that this actually is not a surprising statement. It, we had to prove it. It's not true if I if I drop some conditions. Like it's not true if I drop semi simplicity. But the idea is that this group is kind of like uh, 
a, a pi n of something, or maybe it's kind of like a pi, a dual to pi n of something. And so this is kind of like the statement, the sort of morally like the statement that fundamental, that, that the higher homotopy groups of a space are up here. And so it's morally a version of kind of Posnikov extension theory that says that every space is built out of a non-abelian group at the bottom and then a bunch of abelian groups above it connected together in some complicated way. Anyway, for the purposes of, of the, the project that I'm telling you about, this tells you that to go from Wn to Wn plus one is to do an abelian extension. That's the type of thing I have to look for because I have to look for an abelian extension and I have to look for an abelian extension just by an ordinary group. We think that the whole tower is actually an abelian extension, but that we haven't proved. Um, so we actually think the whole, I mean, I'm sort of anticipating something I might get to at the end of the talk. We think the whole higher kind of fun Galois group is an abelian group, or rather an infinite group, but we don't know that. We do know that every level, that it's built out of abelian pieces. And again, that's really just saying that it's like a solvable group. Every solvable group is built out of abelian pieces. So I'm telling you that it's, this is a solvable group. And I'm telling you what the levels, what the sort of sol the subquotients of that solvable group are. Okay. So now I can dive in. So right, so I have this field extension I'm looking for is an abelian field extension. It's an abelian field extension by an ordinary group in some degree. I mean, there's no there's no higher groups that I have to think about yet. And um Okay, so now I can start looking for abelian extensions. So this is the next step of the construction. So a tower was a type of, of omega spectrum. It was a type of spectrum of categories. Every category has a space living inside of it, of its, of its space of objects. And if I have a monoidal category, then it also has a space of invertible objects. And if I have a tower of categories and look at the sequence of spaces, which are just the invertible objects inside of those categories up to iso you know, the, and, and isomorphisms, then this gives me a tower of spaces. So, so this is like the, the invertibles, this is the, the, the group of units in my tower. So the way that I want you to think is the categories, categories are like rings, they have sort of non-invertible non stuff, spaces or groups or loop spaces, these are, these are like groups. These are only invertible things. And then there's a general theorem that, that I'm just gonna call extension theory. It, it's kind of, those of you who might know some fusion category theory, this is a kind of ENO extension theory. It's also, if you come from a topology background, this is a kind of Tom construction. If you come from a Galois theory background, I could tell you this extension theory in yet another way. But there's a general extension theory that tells you how to classify abelian extensions of anything. It doesn't matter what the thing is. If you have a thing and you want to do abelian extensions of that thing, then these are classified by what you do is you take the thing, you de-loop it. Remember, this just means basically the modules for the thing. And you take the invertibles inside of that. So this is invertible C modules is all this is. So this is sort of the Picard group of, but it's a, it's a higher object. It's, it's a thing that looks like the Picard group of C. What is this? This is a thing that looks like, um, it looks like pick the Picard group of C and then it looks like the invertibles in C in degree, in higher degrees. So in degree zero, it looks like the Picard group of C and in higher degrees, it looks like the invertibles in C. That's, that's who who this guy is. And um, it's, it's a general statement that if you have any commutative ring and wanna know abelian extensions of it, then they're classified by an abelian group together with a map into this Picard spectrum. Okay. So, what do I know? I wanted to do the case when C was, I want the case when, when C is, yeah, I wrote it 
I want the case when C is loops of my previous algebraic closure, or sorry, the suspension of my previous algebraic closure. And so this thing, whatever it is, it has two things I have to compute in degrees zero and one, and then it just has my, my previous algebraic closure in degrees two and higher. So this, here I push it up one, here I push it up a second level. Now it's another general fact. So now, so the whole thing that I care about, so I care about the double loop space of the n minus first algebraic closure and the invertibles. And this is a thing that looks like, well, it looks just like the whole tower in dimensions two and above, because that's where it looks like um, Wn minus one. And my whole algebraic closure, if it exists, will definitely have um, what's called the, the I don't know, the, probably the Cartier dual to spheres, the Pontryagin, it's a, the dual groups to spheres. So as its spectrum of invertibles. This is a, a just from the universal property of this spectrum IC cross. IC cross is a kind of um, recently popular spectrum in, in quantum field theory. It was kind of um, something invented by, by probably Anderson in the, in the 20th century. Um, and then Fred and Hopkins made a big deal about it in their paper on reflection positivity. And so now um, a bunch of kind of quantum field theorists are excited about IC cross. It's a actually so IC cross is a spectrum that satisfies the following universal property. It says that for any other spectrum, any other omega spectrum, the maps from that spectrum into IC cross, so pi zero of that of that space of maps, is the space of maps just from the zeroth homotopy group of your spectrum into C cross. The fact that such a spectrum exists is a non-trivial statement that Anderson helped to prove. And it's sort of using the fact that C cross itself is an invertible abelian group. And it uses a little bit more than that. Maybe it uses also some other facts about, about um, the, the derived category of abelian groups. The, um, anyway, if you, if you unpack the universal property for what I'm calling algebraic closure and just test it on group algebras themselves, then you find um, that you know who the units in your algebraic closure are. Okay, so as I said, the spectrum I care about is not quite IC cross, but it looks like IC cross above degree, in degrees two and above. Specifically, it looks like a, a particular shift of IC cross, like the, the where you shift in by degree by n plus one. This uh, a topologist would have written this as sigma n plus one IC cross, but I'm using sigma for something else. So that's why I'm not writing it that way. And then now I can just tell you the main theorem that we proved. So the main theorem of the talk is that, um, that there does indeed exist a unique semi-simple tower W, which has the following properties. It has super vector spaces in degree one and IC cross worth of units. And this, and you build it to, um, to, to build it, you build it inductively. You just arrange so that that you take, so I you arrange A, so you look for the universal abelian extension. So you look, what well, you prove, yeah, so the actual theorem is the following. The theorem is that this mapping problem um, has a universal answer. So this is not necessarily true because it's the wrong side of universality for these constructions to have necessarily had a universal solution. What we do is we, we use a whole bunch of sort of various facts about IC cross and about, about just like homological algebra over the integers. And from those facts, we prove that this mapping problem for, for um, that I care about has an, a universal solution. And then we work inductively to show that that universal solution lets us go up another dimension. Um, and and so that that proof and and it has a unique and because it's universal it's the unique solution. So that gives us a unique tower which has these two desiderata that it has super vector spaces in degree one and IC cross worth of units. And then the second statement is that and this tower that we build is algebraically closed. So this sort of finished the strategy I told you. My strategy was I assume I have an algebraically closed object. I study some facts that I can derive from it, and then I 
find the only thing that satisfies those properties and then I prove it's algebraically closed. Um, I want to pause a moment and mention that um, the question of building something with these two properties was originally posed by, um, by Mike Hopkins. So I should have, I should have given, given Hopkins name. So Hopkins had asked, he didn't know, he, this, he was like, this was, you know, maybe 15 years ago, Mike Hopkins asked for um, some tower of categories, which had super vector space at the top and IC cross worth of units. Um, Mike didn't know about semi-simple towers yet. Those, that notion hadn't been invented yet. And he didn't have the sort of general algebraic closedness stuff. This was just, he just sort of knew that there would be something interesting if this tower existed. He knew that there should be a universal thing for some ambiguous notion of what universal meant. And what, what basically what I've been doing for the last 10 years was to work out all of the, like to answer this, um, this request of Mike's. So um, maybe Mike, it's what is it, 2023 now. So maybe Mike asked this about 10 years ago and about, about eight years ago, I started to say, oh, we should be looking at algebraic closure. And then about five years ago, three years ago, I was like, okay, we have a good notion of semi-simplicity and Kirby completion, and trying to build up this stuff. Do the Galois theory. Okay. So, um, yeah, so let me tell you all, I did tell you about, about Mike. Okay, I'm, I'm getting, I'm forgetting um, my, my slides. So, so, okay, so I'll say again what I said. So, so the existence of, um, the existence of a W with, with, the, those two disorderata was first speculated by Mike, and and the reference, as I said, is the same reflection positivity paper that got everybody very excited about IC cross. And the reason why Dan Freed and Mike Hopkins thought to look for this tower was um, that they they wanted they they weren't originally after algebraic closure theory in general or Gal, higher Galois theory. What they were after was a more vague notion that they wanted to find a universal category where all quantum field theories, or at least all topological field theories take values. And one of the things that they um, explain in the beginning of their reflection positivity theory paper, reflection positivity paper, is that IC cross itself is the correct universal target for invertible topological field theories. This is just a, this, this is just a spectrum. It's not a category. It doesn't have non-invertible stuff in it. So it's not the right world for doing non-invertible field theory, but it is the right world for doing invertible field theory, for doing like invertible phases of matter. Moreover, this, it's, it's correct in the sense that if you tell me any partition function of an invertible phase of matter, um, then I can find a unique fully, fully extended invertible phase of matter valued in IC cross. And the way you should think about um, our W that I built with, with Reuter is that what we've done is we've upgraded from invertible to semi-simple. And um, for, for topological field theories, this is really a sort of huge upgrade. An invertible topological field theory is one that doesn't have any extended operators. The, the category of extended operators is trivial. And a semi-simple topological field theory is one whose operators are semi-simple, but not necessarily trivial. So, so we don't have a place where like non-semi-simple non field theories can live, but we do have a, now the universal world that can house semi-simple field theories. Okay, but now you might say, well, great, you have your weird, funny category, what's it good for? I actually, maybe you actually care about semi-simple field theories built just out of ordinary vector spaces. Maybe you don't like fermions, so you wanna do bosonic field theory. And I would tell you that, that, that this then gets into kind of the Galois half, the Tanaka duality half of the Nostolen sets, um, which is that, that like, what is, what is a thing over the real numbers? It's a thing over the complex numbers with a symmetry. 
the symmetry given by complex conjugation. And, and so, so that, that principle extends. If you care about some other category and about field theories in some other category, those are just field theories in my category, which I completely can control together with a symmetry by whatever the relative Galois group of that extension is. At least if the extension from your category to my category is Galois. So um, I think I will keep going, but as I said, please interrupt with, with questions. And um, so, so the last thing I wanna tell you is um, what the act, what the Gal Galois group looks like. So I told you we've built, we we understand, we've completely built the um, the semi-simple algebraic closure of the kind of in higher categories, higher categorical semi-simple algebraic closure. Um, and now we want to understand the Galois group. So how do you build the Galois group? Well, the, this my category was built out of many many layers. I started with this. I, like at every time I went up a category number, I, I did a simple, a, an abelian extension just by an ordinary group. And so the Galois group is going to be just an, uh, have um, pieces coming from each of those, ex those sub extensions, some, some kind of something like that. Each of those sub extensions was abelian. And the Galois group of an abelian extension is really easy. You, it's just the dual group to the grading group of the abelian extension. So calculating the, the Galois, the, this sort of absolute Galois group, at least calculating how it is an extension, not necessarily calculating the total group, but calculating its kind of decomposition as an extension is the same as calculating all of these um, sets, all these groups, these grading groups for each sub extension. And when you unpack what this is, well, what did I tell you this was? So, WN was the universal home for n-dimensional field theories. This is, this is the universe of n-dimensional field theories, the topological field theories. Pi zero means that I work up to, sort of I take simple things connected by, modulo those that are connected by a map. And if I think of WN as field theories, then connected by a map means connected by an interface, a defect between field theories. Like you have a, you have some, you have some field theory. Um, on one side, you have some physical material, you have some other material, and you stick, uh, and, and you have a, a, an interface between those materials. And if they're connected by an inter by a non-zero interface, then they're in the same component. So I'm trying to compute field theories, kind of modulo those that are connected to the trivial theory. Field theories that are connected to the trivial theory are, are, are sometimes called a Levin when type, but different, different groups have different names for these. So this is what I'm trying to analyze. I'm trying to analyze the um, what I need to analyze is I need to analyze semi-simple theories, modulo being able to sort of change by non-zero interface. Um, or, or you could say modulo kind of generalized gaugings, modulo condensation, whatever term you like for that. And um, in, in dimension four, this is what, what Lan Kong and Wen explained how to do. So they, they explained how to classify these actually, and, and their strategy works in higher dimensions. It's, it's, uh, it's basically a version of surgery theory for field theories rather than surgery theory for manifolds. Um, topological field theories are kind of dual to manifolds. So it's like dual to surgery theory. So the way Lin Kong and Wen do their construction is the following. They pick up a topological field theory of some high dimension. That topological field theory has operators. It has extended operators of all sorts of dimensions. I think it has, has line operators and surface operators. If you go in and grab just the operators of dimension below half, strictly below half, then that subcategory of operators is necessarily symmetric monoidal because there's enough room for the operators to just sort of get around each other completely. By universality of W, that symmetric monoidal subsector has a map to W. 
And that map is Galois, which means I can write the, that subcategory as basically the representations of a group. This is a kind of higher Tanaka duality, is what I'm telling you. Every symmetric middle category looks like representations of a group, at least over the, the super vector spaces of this. And so, and specifically, I can think of this, this as like, like the, I can recognize my subsector of, of low dimensional operators as rep G for some kind of gauge group G. They become like the Wilson operators for a gauge theory. I can think of them that way. And I can I can then ungauge that G operator. So some people call it ungauging, some people call it condensing. I want you to think of it as surgery. I want you to think that I'm surgering along these operators if you know if you know surgery theory for manifolds. Um, and when I do that surgery, I get it, it produces for me a new topological field theory whose um where I've gotten rid of all the operators that I've gauged, I've like ungaged all away all the operators. I've surgered away all the operators. So for those of you who know some manifold theory, what I'm this is analogous to saying if I want to understand a manifold, I could pick some low dimensional homology of that manifold, and I could do a surgery that gets rid of, or maybe it's the high dimensional homology. I can't remember. You can do a surgery to get rid of the yeah. If you have sort of low dimensional homology that's represented by low dimensional cycles. And because they're low dimensional, you can just move the cycles completely apart from each other. And so surgering around them doesn't enter, like you don't create anything new. You can surger all the cycles separately if they're low dimension. High dimensional cycles, you can, you get stuck on each other when you try to surgery. Not a manifold. So this is the same thing. I surger away the low dimensional operators. The last statement I need to tell you is that, that Topological field theories like manifolds have a Poincare duality. That um, if you have no operators of low dimension, you also have no operators of high dimension. This is the same thing with manifolds. If you have no homology in low dimension, you also have no homology in high dimension because the, the homology in complementary dimensions has to pair by right? Poincare duality. And so Half the time, this just gets rid of all the operators. And the other half the time, it leaves some operators just in middle dimension. This is the same thing with manifolds. Half the time, you can get rid of all the homology. The other half the time, you get, have some homology left in middle dimension. And um, if you have no operators at all, that's the same as being invertible. In manifold theory, I'm telling you, if you have no homology at all, if you're a homology sphere, then you're probably an actual sphere. That's like what invertible corresponds to. And there's some sort of middle dimensions where there's sort of some issues with the kind of, but but most of the time, if, you, if you're a homology, anyway, I'm trying to get to being a homology sphere. Being invertible is like a homology sphere, maybe an actual sphere. Okay, so now I'll just tell you the, 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 the end of our calculations. So um, doing this surgery theory, we find that, that even dimensional field theories are always, you can always surgery them to invertible ones. And odd dimensional field theories, when you surgery them, you end up with a, a group in middle dimension, um, which has a non-degenerate skew form on it, or non-degenerate kind of form on it, which is the, the linking number. And you can surge your Lagrangian subgroups. And so what you find out in, in, is that, that um, n-dimensional field theories up to, up to surgery are classified by um, so this is this is n-dimensional field theories up to surgery. Which was the group I wanted to calculate originally. These are um, no, this is n plus one d, something like that. N minus one d field theories up to surgery. And to think about a dimension. Um, so this was the group I want up to sort of indexing. This is the group I want to classify. It ends up being um, trivial when n is half the time. So when n, n is odd, then n minus one is even. And then the other half the time, it's just a, basically an, an element from L theory, from surgery theory. And so this, this gives us a calculation for, so that we find that the fundamental, the, our Galois group looks like 
that had some homotopy groups of spheres in it, some, some of these funny L theory groups. Um, and, and this sort of surgery sequence. Um, yeah. So that, that's what we find is a, is a long exact sequence for the homotopy groups of our L group. So this is, this is like a kind of the, the, the second main theorem of, the, of our work. The first main theorem being that, that there is an algebraic closure. The second main theorem is this kind of surgery calculate the understanding of its scalar group. So let me kind of, I assume I should finish at the hour. So that's what I'm aiming to do. Um, so, so right, I repeated the, the theorem that, that we have a uh, kind of a surgery description of the Galois groups and how they relate to homotopy groups of spheres and L groups. We can do a little bit better. We understand this connecting map in the surgery description pretty well because it's sort of a piece of L theory. It's a piece of classical surgery theory. And so when, when N is odd, this whole group is zero. So this connecting map is zero. When n is zero mod four, it turns out that um, we can show that this map has an, is an injection because, because we use some theory of bosonic refinements. And when n is two mod four, then this map, this is just a Z2, and this map selects the arf kaver invariant when the arf, it sort of sends any, so fundamental groups of the sphere are, are the, this is the stable homotopy types of groups of the sphere. These are the same as, as framed manifolds. And this map when N is two mod four measures the R, the curvere invariant of the manifolds. Now it's a sort of hard, I think it's like a 200 page theorem of Hill, Hopkins and Ravenel that the curvere invariant of a manifold always vanishes of a framed manifold. It can be non-zero for non-framed manifolds, but for framed manifolds, it always vanishes except for in five or six specific dimensions. So the upshot is that using this sort of calculation of Hill, Hopkins and Ravenel, this connecting map is almost always zero. But on the other hand, this Galois groups, these were something about topological field theories. And this is something about kind of invertible field theories. This is something about anomalies for topological field theories. And so the, the corollary, the sort of physics corollary is that um, if you have a quantum field theory with, with non-trivial gravitational anomaly, then it's necessarily gapless, except for in sort of six, six possible dimensions. So this like, our work really has physical content. We're sort of saying uh, it, that, that, so gapless phases are things that have, con that can conduct signal, like that, you know, sort of, that are conducting. So what I'm telling you is that if you have a, that I'm telling you, what am I telling you? I'm telling you that if you have an invertible phase of matter, um, which is not the trivial phase and not the sort of arf curvere phase in these six dimensions, then it's boundary, um, it's then along the boundary, the, in the bulk it's invertible. So there's no dynamical degree, no nothing at all going on in the bulk. It's definitely an insulator. But I'm telling you that on the boundary, there's necessarily conductance on the boundary. This is the type of theorem people knew in low dimensions, and then I'm telling it to you in all dimensions. Um, so I think I have like, a, I wrote a few more slides that are just sort of going deeper and deeper into technical things. I think I've said a lot of technical stuff. Um, so, so I don't know how much more to say. Maybe I should just like stop now and say thank you for your attention because I've been going for an hour and. If you have questions or want to see more, I can, but I, I assume that some people are going to want to politely depart. Oh, so. uh, let's thank Theo for this wonderful talk. Actually, it is a very uh, interesting talk with full of interesting ideas. So maybe I would like to ask a few questions. So yes. the Galois group that you constructed is like, uh stepwise abelian extension abelian group yes. right so it is kind of pro solvable or solvable we can consider it like that right yes that's right i mean i like and you're right completely correct that pro solvable is the better the better notion because it does so, go forever actually this reminded me of one thing if we consider local fields i mean the absolute value group of a local field is pro solvable also yeah so I mean, uh, I don't know if there is any relation or not, but I mean, uh, such phenomena exist in uh, algebraic number theory, 
where a very important class of uh, field, local fields, their absolute Galois group is pro-solvable. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I know very little algebraic number theory, so I don't have much to to say. I kind of, I, I want to, you know, eventually we'll actually write this all up. My hope is that our, like I would love for this sort of higher Galois group to be um, exactly used in these kind of, as a sort of so yeah, number and theory that's why the Galois group thing. Uh, do you have some sort of Galois correspondence uh, for higher Galois groups? Uh, yes, I mean, what well, we have, what I can, like, the, this world of higher towers, um, right, so so I sort of, I said it very quickly on the, maybe on the very first slide. Um, which is that, that the Galois part of ordinary Galois theory, just for complex numbers, but you could do it for any, I mean, I, it could replace R by any field and C by its algebraic by its Galois closure. And then if you if you have any field and its Galois closure, and if you impose a very strong size constraint on your algebra, namely that the algebra be a se separable algebra, separable commutative algebra over your fields, then this map is an ISO. And that's a version of Galois of Galois correspondence. Right. This is like so I mean, a separable field, a semi-simple field is just a direct sum of field extensions. And it's so it's this is, this is, that's exactly what I mean, is yeah. etal algebra. Uh, like finite etal algebra. Yeah. Or, um, otherwise you have to put in some profineness. So this is exactly a statement of Galois correspondence. Deline's theorem, this is, this is this sort of, the one dimension up version of Galois correspondence is Tanakhian duality. Right. So I, I um, like it's and and this same wh whether you want to call it Galois correspondence or Tanakhian duality again you have to put in quite severe size constraints on a to make it work you have to be doing its hall extensions and not larger extensions than that but you know its hall is almost just being semi simple it's like semi simple plus some finiteness and and so um, like some my some little so anyway. Um, this type of statement that you have this type of isomorphism, the in higher categories, a higher category theorist would call this the Barbeck theorem. Barbeck theorem in general is a sort of methods to compare a category to this type of, of curried category. And so yes, there's very good general techniques to establish these and, and indeed I'm confident. Well, I, I should say, as it, I said this on the very first slide, everything is in progress and in progress means um, we we are confident about all the proofs, but we haven't actually like like it's not that we haven't written them down. Pretty much everything I told you, I have very very long email exchanges with with David um, with all the details. But they're in long email exchanges. We haven't like sat down and written the document that compiles the complete proof. And as you all know we will discover that there's some gaps when we do that, but, um, but I am confident about, yeah. about this, that we, that there is a Galois correspondence. So, I mean, there is one question uh, when I uh, uh, listened to your talk. So for example, can we consider higher scheme theory and cohomology is uh, say a uh, motivic theory on higher scheme theory that will, that should be connected with your talk, I believe. And what I suspect then is that those higher motives, let's say, should connect, be connected with this uh, quantum field theory thing, probably. Um, I. That sounds fantastic. I have nothing to like. I it's not it's not something I've thought about. Like you ask, can you? And my answer is, I, I give you permission. <laughs> like. <laughs> Okay. Um, no, of course, I would love, I, I absolutely think that, like, I, I absolutely want to invite you to think of these towers of categories as the, the like, I, I want you to think of them, they are the higher commutative rings. Right. Every, every commutative ring gives you a sort of suspension tower by just taking the kind of Karubi completion of its one-point loopings. But there's more than that than just the regular rings. And so this is this is a world that contains ordinary commutative rings as a full subworld. 
And yes, you com should completely do higher schemes. Um, I, as I said, I don't know what a, what abelian, what sort of, I don't know how to, but this is my own personal lack of knowledge right now. I event, I expect in a few years, maybe you'll have me back and I'll tell you what an abelian higher category is, or I'll tell you sort of, like, it's not that I think semi-simplicity is that great. Semi-simplicity is kind of most interesting rings in algebraic geometry are not semi-simple. Um, but I just don't know how to get away from semi-simplicity yet. Towers don't have to be semi-simple, but they but you shouldn't be doing ring theory without something like abelian categories or linear presentable categories or some sort of linear linear algebraic control. And I just don't have a good theory developed there. But once that happens, then we will have this sort of grand brave world of higher commutative rings and higher schemes that we could play with. Um, and of course, there is a grand brave world of higher commutative rings. There's the world of like E infinity rings that people that the derived algebraic geometers have studied. This is, I think, a different world. It's not unrelated. I've used and under the hood, I'm using a lot of infinity category theory, but um, but it's a different world. For instance, like for any group, for any algebraic group, the stack BG, BG is an element of my world because it I can think of it as the the delooping of the of rep g, right? And somehow spec of rep g is b g. And um, already derived geometry, um, b g is not an affine scheme in derived geometry. Whereas um, even even in derived geometry, it's like I mean it is you can write it anyway. There's sort of subtleties about about like the functions in derived geometry on BG are like the cohomology of G. And, and some groups you can reconstruct from their cohomology and other times you can't. It depends on say the characteristic, it depends on sort of various things. Um, and, and whereas in my world, every group is, is affine. I see. Every, every, every stack every, is affine. Like, Thank you. Uh, so, any more questions or comments? So I have one late question. Uh, oh, please. Late, what is the? Is there any relationship between surgery classification of TQFTs and coborism hypothesis classification? Um, in the case of coborism hypothesis, there is no same simplicity conditions or something like this. But can we see coborism hypothesis in the exact sequence, or they are not related at all? So the the relation, I mean, in some sense, like I have, I, I, you know, I sort of incorporate. I mean, they're like it's sort of the, one of the relations is just sort of built in, like it's sort of incorporated as a, it's like folded in at the at the beginning of the problem rather than as a conclusion of the problem, which is just that I will I will like any time I have a category with. Good duality theory, like like my WN, I can I'm allowed to think of its elements as TFTs valued in that category. That's a part of the cobordism hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And so I've sort of just that that mindset, that sort of visualizing elements as TFTs, is a part of the cobordism hypothesis. Okay, because the space of TFTs is a manifold. And then you said, is that, is that, is that right. right. But, but you are asking a sort of, there's a better answer to your question, which is that, that of course, a different thing a topological field theory is, is that like the, the Copernicus hypothesis has a non-trivial, is a non-trivial statement in topology. Um, and, and, um, and so really what I want you to think is that, that Copernicus hypothesis says that WN or my, my algebraic closure W is some version of being like the dual to manifolds. Topological field theories are like some kind of non-invertible quantum version of, co of, of co like you have manifolds, there's like the, you know, manifolds up to boredism and field theories up to, up to defect are sort of dual constructions. Okay. So, so, so in that, from that perspective, um, some of the maps I told you, like this really is kind of through that duality, this is supposed to be kind of dual, 
this like is a sort of dual statement from I mean, this is also dual because Galois is dual to the to this is like basically dual to W because Galois the Galois groups are dual to the grading groups. Um, anyway, so our theorem, our surgery is like is is. Let me sort of, what am I trying to say? There's there's a there's a non there's sort of some parts of it that I don't have a precise statement for. It feels dual to the cohortism hypothesis. So the other thing I didn't have time to say, maybe this is a good chance to say. It, is that the classical surgery theory that looks like this. There is a sort of famous theorem in, in surgery theory for frame manifolds. So this is the fundamental groups of spheres is just the just frame manifolds up to cobordism. Mm -hmm. And there's a surgery theory for frame manifolds up to cobordism, which has a different L theory as its output and mm -hmm. a different third thing as the, um, the, the kind of third side of the triangle. In, in the surgery theory for classical manifolds, the what you have is you have the fundamental groups of spheres, a dual, a, a sort of different L group. This is an L group that of, of kind of finitely generated abelian groups, whereas the L group I'm using is actually the L group of finite abelian groups. And instead of the Galois group, you have the piecewise linear group. Um, so that's like a, a, a the, um, so it's really doing like piecewise linear manifold theory. Okay. Um, and so what, if you compare the two surgery descriptions, what we think is going on is that our Galois group is basically like a profinite completion of the piecewise linear group. You know that Galois groups are supposed to be profinite. That was one of the things you learned the first time you learned about Galois groups. They're like, they're, Galois groups are not actual groups. They're merely profinite groups. And ours, this is what it looks like. I, this is, don't take this as a precise statement. I mean, there, there is a sort of precise version of profinite completion in algebraic topology. I don't think I mean that precise version. I mean, this is like a kind of moral, like roughly speaking, this is how we think of it. And this isn't too weird. So one of the things that Lurie just sort of mentions as a side remark. So people who've studied the, the cobordism hypothesis for, um, what one of the sort of outputs of cobordism hypothesis that people really like is the fact that that framed manifolds, the space of all framed n manifolds, has an action by the orthogonal group that rotates the framings around. And this action via the cobordism hypothesis becomes an action, a sort of dual action on the space of of of, it, of dualizable objects in your n-dimensional in your mm -hmm. n category. Well, actually, the space of framed manifolds has a bigger action, not just the orthogonal group acts, but actually the piecewise linear group acts. And this is uh, uh, because um, this is a slightly non-trivial statement. It says that, that if you have a piecewise linear action uh, manifold and want to give a smoothing, um, that smoothing induces some micro, micro local information. Like it's a, there's a reduction of structure that that smoothing selects. But the non-trivial statement is that that microlocal information suffices, that actually if you give a reduction, if you have a piecewise linear manifold and you give a, a reduction of structure from its, P, from its PL tangent bundle to being a diff to an, or an ON tangent bundle, then you, there's a unique smoothing compatible with that. But what this means is this means that if your manifold was piecewise linear framed, then of course the framing already reduces the structure all the way to a point all the way to trivial. So what I'm telling you is that I'm telling you that a framed PL manifold has a unique smoothing compatible with its framing. And so that tells you that actually when I built the cobordism category, I didn't have to use smooth manifolds. I get the same framed cobordism category if I use PL manifolds versus the framed cobordism category of smooth manifolds. So those are the same category. And so the same statement that ON acts actually tells you that PLN acts. Now Lurie states without any proof at all that PLN is actually the complete group of automorphisms of, bordism, of framed bordism category. He just makes this like an offhand remark and he doesn't go back to it in the paper. Like mm -hmm. I told you how it acts. I don't know why it's the complete group, but Lurie is usually correct about everything he says. Um, and, and so let's take him at his word. So then PLN definitely acts on any category with enough dual, dualizability. 
my Galois group also acts on my category. And these actions are almost the same. They're not the same because like, they're just not the same group. And my Galois group didn't know about the number N. It was something that worked for all N. Whereas PLN does like the, if you, the levels of PLN kind of fit together, but they're not a, that's not a Posnikov tower. So um, it can't be quite the same, but this is, this is why I think that my Galois theory, my Galois group is basically PL. Um, so this is the actual answer to your question is that yes, there's like a deep cabordism hypothesis thing going on, but I don't know the precise things. I'm just saying like, this is what it looks like to me. This is where we're going. Thank you so much. For the next goal. Thanks so much. Uh, any more questions or comments? Okay, then let's thank Theo once more. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. And hopefully in future you will uh, visit Istanbul and uh, I would love to come. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. So I am now stopping the video uh, recording.